All right, if you have your Bibles with you this evening, we would ask that you turn to Exodus, Exodus chapter 23, and we're going to only read one verse for our text tonight, and I know you should each and every one be blown away about that, because we don't have my usual 10 to 15 verse text. Uh, Exodus chapter 23, and verse 9 alone. The Bible says Moses writing to his people and recording what was said, Also, thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. God, we pray tonight that you would use the Holy Ghost to bless your word to the heart of the hearers, Lord, that we would remember our position on this earth. Earth is very temporal. It's minor in comparison to eternity. We pray that you'd make that our, uh, our thought and our prayer each and every day. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, maybe some not-so-familiar verses. Usually when ex uh, we read Exodus, we read about the literal Exodus or the plagues or uh, the sparing of Moses in the time of oppression. But once they got to the other side of the Red Sea, we know they spent many years wandering. The law they were given was really given to be instituted when they got to the Promised Land. And uh, they used it along the way, but I will say this, they did not obey it entirely. Now that's the problem with the law. It cannot be obeyed entirely because of the depraved nature of man. We're broken. We're, we're in an unfixed condition. That's why the law simply uh, serves as a schoolmaster not to describe the perfect, but to describe sin. Man. And that, that's why the law uh, was given. Now, as Moses is recording this, he gives them a reminder how to deal with strangers. Now, I've seen this text preached many times, and there's no, I won't say it's been taken out of context that way, but sometimes I don't know that we recognize it for what it says, and that is being kind to strangers. And certainly we should do that. Uh, if someone comes to your home, they don't have something to drink, they uh, don't have something to eat, provide that need for them, and that you have entertained strangers. I mean, you have uh, entertained angels unawares. And so that's certainly good, uh, a good thing, but I want you to see that the key element is the stranger, the one that's different. Now, you think about 400 years in a pagan land, and they never picked up the pagan customs. You could still see a Jew from 100 miles away. They were, well, what was the classic, when you look at the, uh, the Egyptian uh, sphinx and, and the Egyptian statues and the sarcophagus that have survived, a key element of Egyptians was they shaved their entire bodies. And sometimes they left a minor beard, but usually not. One reason they were so overrid with lice, they had to get rid of the hair. The other reason, they thought that's what the gods looked like, so they didn't want hair either. And, and, and so we see that, that in that, a Jew could be spotted a mile away. Uh, the, the Egyptians ran around with one little thing across their, their, their waist, and that was the extent of the male garment. The Jews still looked like Jews. They wore modest apparel. They stuck out like a sore thumb in a world that looked totally different. That was the Jew. Now, I'm sure since the bulk majority of the population was Egyptian, they're like, man, that's strange. I want you to look. It's hot as blue blazes out here, and I want you to look at them. Right? Egypt is not a cool environment to live in. Right along the Nile River, it's very humid. It's a very, a very hot culture, a hot climate to be in. And here these strange people are walking around fully clothed. Now that, that was a strange thing. 
Now, in the modern day, you can think about it, and there's lots of different ways to measure this and lots of different ways to look at this, but what do you think about horse and buggy, Amish, or Mennonite? I think they're strange. Now, that, that may see forthright, but I know you do too. I'm just, I have enough brass to say it. That's very strange. I can't imagine driving my horse and buggy to Paris, Tennessee and going all over Henry County seeing patients and then driving my buggy back to Stewart County. It can't be done. That's a very strange thing. But what? When you see them, you know they're one of two groups, don't you? They're either Old Order Amish or they're Old Order Mennonite just by what they're doing. Right? And, and so we see then, they're strange folks. You, you see their bold haircuts. You're like, well, I know where they came from. I remember one time little Henry, uh, I was talking to him, and I said, Henry, everybody, every group has their own thing. And, and he looked at me strange, and I said, just look at your hair, Henry. If I ran a hair, round of hair that long, I said, they would be ready to call me out. And he started laughing. But I really think I got the point home. He saw that there were differences and they weren't exactly necessarily right about everything. And, and, and so we find then we live in a very, very strange day. And the recent months working in Henry County and Paris is a very strange place. Uh, we did well sending a missionary there. And uh, it, it, it's just strange and I, it boggles my mind what's considered normal. It boggles my mind what's considered routine. Yeah. Uh, and when you look at it, you just have to shake your head and, and, and go on. Uh, the other day, I, I, I was driving home, work was finally done, headed on the parish, uh, the Dover Road on my way home, just left the office, and just right there on the side of the road, was, I, I was assuming I'm assuming it was a gentleman. Jury's still out. Purple hair with red streaks. And I was just like, you know, if you want to dye your hair, won't, won't, won't we go with something that actually, yeah, you know, that you actually seen before. Like, uh, you know, people have never been satisfied with their hair color. Uh, I wanted to be blonde as a kid. Can you imagine this black head being blonde? Uh, if a beautician could do that, I, my hat's off to her. But we're never satisfied with those kind of things, are we? And, and it's, but God made us this way for a reason, did he not? Right. What's the reason for man? That's Charles Spurgeon's and, and, and his uh, catechism of the Baptist Church. The whole duty of man is to glorify God. You know what that's going to get you? That's going to make you look strange. That's going to identify you with this group that, uh, that Moses said, you've been nice to these people because you're going to be strangers. Another portion of the Bible, I think it's in the Psalms, says that we are strangers and pilgrims here presently. Now, that, that tends to add, you have to answer this question for yourself because I certainly can't. Do you feel like a stranger? Do you feel different? Do you ever feel awkward? I think that's probably the best word, don't you? That you simply just don't fit in. That you're not where you belong. And if that is, give glory to God for it, because you know what? It's not a normal thing. Most people, even that call themselves Christians, are well at home here today. They're very satisfied with the culture that now exists, where we should have never been a part of it to start with. You ever wonder what the whole premise of staying in Eden was? To protect a culture. They sinned and destroyed the whole thing. Yeah. And then they became different. And, and so all through the ages, we've seen that we've never fit in. We've never been part of home. And you know what? It's the Lord's people, God being our helper. Just stop trying. You know what? When you stop trying, you'll begin to relax. When you say, hey, I'm not home yet. I've not crossed the finish line. I shouldn't feel like I'm done. 
then you're okay. Uh, you, you don't have to worry about being called names anymore. Now, go with me to 2 Corinthians. I've read this in your hearing now for over 20 years. And each of you ought to be able to quote it, but we'll read it again uh, for the glory of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in 11, and we know the 1 Corinthian letter was very corrective, and apparently the church of Corinth took it to heart, and they dealt with some issues that had to be dealt with, and now we're some, some suggest as many as two years later. I don't know the timeline on these letters. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning uh, in verse 11, O ye Corinthians... Our mouth is opened unto you, our heart is enlarged. I want you to notice two things, that whatever they had done to correct these problems, and remember this was the same church that had a man running with his stepmother, uh, that church, he says, my heart is just overjoyed, it's enlarged, it, it, it's warmed up. I, I'm gracious to you now. Uh, what, 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 a, what a wonderful testimony. Have you ever thought about this? Every church has a testimony in of itself. Read the church letters. Every one of them had their own personality. Now, with that comes this danger. Every personality can change. Before my brain surgery, one of the warnings that I was given is that I would have a very short fuse afterwards. And you know what? It's come to pass. Unfortunately, my wife and children can't assure you of that. Uh, nothing to be proud of, but it was a predictor. Now, people change, personalities change, and you know what? Churches change too. Uh, what, what did Paul, uh, excuse me, what did John write to the church in Ephesus in the book of the Revelation? Their biggest problem was what? Ye have left your first love. Mm. Right? You, you know what that did to the church at Ephesus? It changed their personality. And so on the flip side of that, and glory be to God, this letter that Paul sent that was somewhat scathing in the information it sent, it changed their personality. It made a difference. They, they were compliant. They, uh, they, they were obedient. Oh, you Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our, our heart is enlarged. Now, when he says his mouth is open, does it mean that he's giving more direction? Possibly. But what, what, what do you do when something shocks you? Oh, my goodness. Oh, you open your mouth, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe he was shocked that they turned around so much. My mouth is open to you. I'm amazed at what you've done. I'm encouraged what God has brought to pass. Oh, you Corinthians, thank you for listening. Thank you for being obedient. Notice what he says this. You're not straightened in us, but you're straightened in your own bowels. Now, being a nurse, I have seen intestines or bowels. And you know what? They're not straight. They're crooked as a dog's hind leg. You know you've got 47 feet of stuff right here? That's a lot, of, that's a lot to twist in one small spot, is it not? Mm -hmm. But what did they believe concerning the Bible? They believed the center of man was right here in this gut. So he says, you're straightening, you're straightening the deep part of yourself. Now, to be straightened in the deep part of yourself, what has to exist right here or in the inner man? A new heart. You know what? You can't, you, you, you can't straighten a wicked, depraved heart. It, it can't be done. But if you are saved, you can be straightened in that because you'll rejoice at the Word of God. The very best barometer of your redemption, do you love the Word of God or do you embrace the Word of God? Do you crave preaching or do you cast it aside? It's very important that you answer that. It's very important that you review that within yourself because you know what? The redeemed... They might not like it at the time. What does the Bible say about that Paul writing? I thank 
maybe it's the Hebrew letter, uh, I can't remember which one, uh, he says, no chastening seemeth good for, for a time, but it bringeth forth meat for repentance. Right. So how do you respond to the Word of God? How does it make you feel? Does it make you hate me? Does it make me, does it make you uh, hate the Word of God? No, it should make us uh, cherish it. Then notice what he says. So he's talking to redeemed people, verse 13. Now for recompense in the same, I speak unto my, I speak unto you as children. In other words, it's paying you back and seeing how good you've done, be you also enlarged, grow, develop, continue. He gives us some warnings. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, that can mean a huge different whole of parameter of things being yoked and unyoked. Marriage is the one we always jump to, and, and there's definitely some applicable stuff there. But you know, there's lots of ways to be yoked up, isn't it? I was uh, talking to a friend, uh, to a patient the other day, and ended up, me and her niece were in the same nursing class in, in nursing school, and she was a sweetheart, just a good girl. Her, her dad was from Stewart County, and I said that was the only, I always told her that was the only reason she was so good. And, uh, but we were talking about the college environment, and Don and I, because we were already married and lived off campus, we got to stay away from that. But you know, um, they would yoke up with all kinds of stuff over there. Sorority, sororities, fraternities. You know you take an oath with those things? That, that's not for God's people to do. You know what? We, uh, we need to avoid governmental office. You know what you do? Have you ever seen the president sworn in except for President Obama? What did they lay their hands on and make an oath, a promise, a covenant to do to defend that constitution? <laughs> Most of them have it in years, but that's what their pledge is to do, right? We, be, we need to be very cautious. It's not a light thing to place your hand on the Word of God and make a solemn promise. Uh, in fact, about what, what is it? Uh, I, can't, I just remember the last part of the verse. He says, be something and swear not. Uh, you know what? I won't take an oath and say, I swear to God. Uh, I believe that's outside the parameter of the scripture. Right. If I'm being sworn in to, uh, I, I'll tell them I promise to tell the truth, but I'm not going to make an oath uh, or to avoid those things. They're part of this world. And, and, and so we find when we begin to think about being yoked up, another problem with being yoked up is this, is that then you're tied to it. Now, I know each of you that were, Brother Jared and, and me and uh, <laughs> Brother uh, Eric, and as much as we try, we're yoked up. Eric, Adam, same situation. We're yoked up to some extent with our workplace, right? You have to hear the trash that goes on. You have to... You have to uh, uh, See the things that come to pass all around you. Now, we're tied to that burden because of Adam. We, we, will, we have to work to the day we die, right? But at the same time, is it not a hindrance to you spiritually? I know it is for me. Because, see, if I'm not very careful, I get to think in the same way they do. Yep. And, and, and so we have to be very cautious with that. You know what that is? That's a yoke. And anytime you have a yoke, it is difficult, it is hard to pull, and it impacts you. You know what a, uh, you know what a yoke will do to a beast? It'll break his heart. He becomes a servant, right? And the same way with us, if we're not very careful, we'll get into that. So be careful of the yokes that you take upon yourself in this present world. And, and you know, the good thing about not living under a yoke, you're ready to go at any time. Uh, a person in a yoke is not a true pilgrim because a pilgrim keeps moving. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
For what fellowship have righteousness to unrighteousness? Now, I've read this a million times in my Christian life, and in thinking about righteousness and unrighteousness, uh, what, what, what is the difference? Well, how would that impact? Now, first of all, let's say this, the righteous are the redeemed, the saved, the born again. Now, the redeemed should act like redeemed folks, right? Now, speaking from personal experience, you get yourself out there with unrighteousness, you're not going to impact them, they're going to impact you. You know, the only thing you can do for a bunch like that is give them the gospel and leave it there and head out. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I convinced myself stupidly that I could be an impact on them. Problem is, in a month, I was doing everything that they were. And so, first of all, part of being a pilgrim is not to engage yourself in that. If you want to remain strange in a strange land, don't get used to it. Don't, don't culminate with it. Don't become part of it. Don't desire the things that this world has available to us. And then he says, what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? And the answer to all three of those questions is nothing. Not a bit. Nothing. There should be no agreement in any of those things, but very often there is. Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? Now, uh, I, I've studied the scriptures millions of times, and I won't say names, but I a Baptist preacher of our brand uh, that married a Campbellite woman. That was the most miserable man I ever knew till she died. You know what he did? He yoked up with an unbeliever. You can call her what she wants to, but that's exactly what it was. She certainly didn't cherish the truth. And you know, this is the reality of that. What I saw in their life, she, he didn't make her miserable. She made him miserable. So who impacted who? So don't think that, that, that <laughs> that's going to be, we have no agreement with them. We, we have no fellowship with them. You ever wonder why relationships are so difficult? That's why. And so we find if we want to remain this fluid person that moves about and can go when God wants them to do, be very careful with whom you go into these relationships. And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? Again, nothing. Now, you remember, it says just in a moment, ye are the temple of God. Whatever you do with this present body, that's what you're doing with the temple of God. You know, we always want to look so perfect and look like everybody else and act like everybody else and be like the world. What was on the outside of the wilderness tabernacle? What was the outside covering? Her. Badger skin. Kind of like a possum. Badger's somewhere between a possum and a beaver. They have a little bit of a different hide. And yeah, yesterday evening I walked out on the porch and there was the biggest possum I ever saw eating out of the cat's bowl. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. He didn't think a thing about me. He looked at me and waddled off the steps. And uh, uh, I thought, you are the ugliest creature, no doubt, that God has ever made. That was what was on the side, outside of the temple. Nothing appealing whatsoever. Now, remember this, it is the nature of mankind to want to be appealing to the world. That, that, that's this flesh. That's who we are. We want to be appealing. Not only fit in, to look good while we're fitting in. And, and, and so we find many times what we have to remind ourselves is, well, should we be satisfied with the badger skin, with the plain, with the normal, with, with, with things that are not elaborate? What agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, 
As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their people, and they shall, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What a wonderful statement. What a cherished truth that we are the people of God. You know what? That doesn't excite people anymore. You know what? It excites me. It makes me glad to think that I'm one of the very sons of the Most High. That, that He is my God and I am His son. I am His servant. I would love to do His bidding more. That's who we are. You know what? People are not, not excited about that anymore. <coughs> and you know what? If the reason why is because of this world. Mm -hmm. If we focused on Christ more, focused on this tiny little group that we call New Testament Baptist Church, we'd get excited. And you know what? If you don't, there may be just something wrong. Amen. If this is not satisfying to you, probably something is wrong. You know, I... I uh, <laughs> I see more and more people leaving the Lord's churches are going where it's the easiest. But I want you to see that's not the position of a pilgrim, is it? Verse 17, Wherefore, because of all these things, because of the nature of God and the nature of the stranger, the pilgrim, wherefore, come from out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Now, we live in a day and age, listen, uh, I, I, sometimes I feel like I'm standing on the island by myself. I know I'm not. Remember when, uh, <laughs> what was it, Elijah thought that? And he says, listen, Elijah, shut up. I have 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. Right. But sometimes you feel that way. You know what? Biblical separation is a forgotten doctrine. It is. And, and we wonder why we have no power with the Almighty? Yeah. Well, it, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure it out, does it? No. We have no strength in the person of Christ. We have no power in the Holy Ghost. Well, that's why. That's it. You can lay your finger on it and, and name it to one another, including myself. That's why there's no power anymore. That's not why there's no strength among God's people. It's because we came in to the world. Wherefore come out from among them, among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Yeah. And then you would have to determine, would you not, what the unclean thing is, what it consists of, uh, what's contaminating, what, what, is, what, what is the cause. This will give you all something to think about. It's a good example, and it'll make you scared at the same time. There was a community of Muslims up in northern Wisconsin. And they had a compound. Got so many people out there that got their own zip code and post office. Well, I promise you. They wanted to take over the whole county. And they created them a small town in and of themselves. So they put a candidate in each of the public offices at election time. Then they poisoned half the town with... Uh, What's the uh, sal salmonella, the chicken, when the one Don is so scared of? And I'm a little scared now after watching that. Um, but they didn't win the elections. That's the good part. But when they were eating those foods, I bet it was some, they don't do fried chicken in the north, so I don't know what they exactly ate. But I bet it tasted good, don't you? I bet it was something palatable. And I bet they'd never ever dreamed by the next morning they'd be near death. This, th this world is palatable, is it not? It tastes good. It feels good. It feels right. But you know what? For the believer, it's not. Be a pilgrim. 
be a stranger, come away and say, I don't belong here. This is not part of who I am. And, and, and you truly will be encouraged spiritually. You will be encouraged in the person that you are. Wherefore come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, if I understand uh, English the way I think I do, it's the promise of verse 18 is tied to the end of verse 17. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. So, if we're daily touching the unclean thing, what are we losing? Not salvation, but we're losing parenthood. Right? All that I have left at home now is these two, three counts ago, <coughs> but these two primarily, they're my responsibility. Yeah. I will correct them. I, I will see that it's done. And you know what? <laughs> we live in a day and age today, we're no longer being corrected by our Heavenly Father. And you know why? It's not that he doesn't care anymore. But if you ever whipped one of your kids so much, and I have, forget about it. Bella's poodle is stupid. I give up on it. That, that dog is not going to be trainable. And uh, I, I just cross my eyes. I give up on it. You keep exposing yourself to the world. You keep trying to fit in. He'll give up on you. No, it's not that it's outside his grace. It's because you won't listen to correction. You know, uh, he'll let us go. What, what does the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 6, I think it is? Um, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thy days may be long upon the earth. Now, we understand God is sovereign, right? But from the, from the context of the verse, I take it as this. If I do mother and daddy wrong, I'm shortening my own days, right? And I believe that to be true. And, and, and so I want you to see in that we can hook up with this world and be redeemed, I'm supposing, but look out, trouble's coming. Right. Look out, trouble's on the way. If you really belong to him, it may not be, it may not be, you know, would to God all my sins would be paid for through and in and of my own body. But listen, our God's much too wise for that. You can do what you want to with me, but when you get to my children, my daughter-in-laws, and my grandchildren, it hurts a lot worse, does it not? You have to understand the Father's love to appreciate that. And um, would to God, but see, the wise God we serve, he, he, he will, he'll, he'll correct you in, th in ways that you didn't dream about. Yeah. And, and, and so we see then as the Lord's people that we should honor this word not uh, as knocked down broken people, but with gladness of heart and willingness of heart and with excitement of heart, proud and glad to be different, to be separate, to be very, very strange. That's where we should want to be.